Good morning and afternoon. Thank you for taking part in Southern Gas Association's Natural Gas Take Action Month and for attending our second webinar, Decarbonization, Past, Present, and Future, and How Natural Gas Makes It Possible. We hope that everyone is safe and healthy during this unique time, and we appreciate your commitment to partnering with us to help change the narrative around natural gas. The purpose of federal and state antitrust statutes is to assure the preservation of a free and competitive economy. To achieve this end, these laws embody a general prohibition against any agreement or combination among competitors, which has the effect of unreasonably restraining trade. It is the policy of SGA to conduct its activities in strict compliance with all applicable federal and state antitrust laws and to avoid any appearance of impropriety. Please note that we've muted all attendees upon arrival today to reduce the background noise since we acknowledge that most of you are still currently working from home. As we're currently relying even more on technology in webinars, we know that technology is great, but in the rare event that you lose connection, do not worry, SGA is recording today's webinar and will send you the recording link. The presentation slides can be found in the handout section on your control panel. Now I would like to introduce Walter Crenshaw, Director of Commercial Business for Cove Point LNG at Dominion Energy to introduce and welcome our speaker. Walter. Hey, thanks, Nicole. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's program. Uh, I'd like to thank Nicole, thank you, and SGA for hosting this short webinar and for putting on this Natural Gas Take Action Month. Um, we're hoping that this program is going to give you some helpful insights uh, when you're out there taking action, um, you know, explaining to people how natural gas has contributed to decarbonization uh, and how it will continue to do so. So uh, I'm very excited to have Kristen Lyons with us to discuss this topic. Uh, this is very timely. They have some research that's coming out uh, in the next week uh, on this very topic. She's willing to share with us uh, early. So very thankful for that. Um, Kristen is a partner with Scott Madden, and she leads the firm's energy practice. Scott Madden is a leading energy consulting firm. It's focused on uh, all the ways energy is generated and transmitted to customers. They provide thought leadership and consulting services on all facets of the power and natural gas business. Kristen joined the firm in 1999 and has consulted with a multitude of clients on issues ranging from process and organizational design to merger integration and project and program management. Uh, she's a leading expert on the power industry and a frequent speaker and panelist at conferences across the country. She led Scott Mann's grid transformation practice for three years before becoming the energy practice lead. Um, we're very excited to have her speaking here today about how natural gas has contributed to decarbonization uh, and how it will be essential to guaranteeing the reliability of our electric system going forward. One other small note is we are trying to keep this webinar short for you, uh, and so we will not be taking questions. But if you have any follow-ups, you can definitely contact Kristen for contact information in the chat or through the website for Scott Madden, scottmadden.com, which will also be listed on the, the last slide. So with that, Kristen, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. So um, as Walter said, he contacted me a couple of weeks ago about the possibility of speaking on this topic, and the timing was fortuitous. Our organization has actually just completed an analysis of the contribution that switching to natural gas has made to the reduction in carbon emissions across the country. And I'm going to share with you a preview of a document that's going to be published in a couple of weeks. Um, and I'll show you where you can subscribe to that if, if you're interested in downloading it when it is published. So um, I'm going to start off with what the state of play is today as it pertains to carbon emissions. So I'm just moving something. There we go. Um, so as we talk about the total reduction in carbon emissions, we use the baseline of 2005 to as the base. Sorry. Um, so we use the baseline of 2005 primarily because that's where the agreement that was reached in Paris under President Obama set the baseline. And the goal was to get to 26 to 28% below 2005 emissions by 2025. So we started there and we looked at what has been accomplished from an emissions reduction perspective through 2019. 
So if you look at the map on the left, this shows by state, and the darker the state, the more emissions reductions have been achieved, what has been achieved in terms of millions of metric tons. Across the US, we've seen 5,500 million metric tons of carbon dioxide reduced. And this, so this is the total of everything, including natural gas switching, as well as the integration of renewables um, and other potential sources. So on the left-hand side, the darker the state, the larger the reduction. And interestingly, places like Texas, Alabama, Florida, Pennsylvania lead the pack. Um, and again, if you think about Alabama, you don't necessarily think of those as a leader in emissions reduction. But if we go to this map on the right, we start to understand why. So the map on the right shows the degree to which these carbon emissions reductions have been attributable to the switch to natural gas. So if we start off with Texas, we look at 622 million metric tons reduced. About a third of that was attributable to switching from natural gas. And if you think about the, the composition of the generation market in Texas, that kind of makes sense. They've moved off of coal, moved on to natural gas, but they also have rich renewable resources, particularly in the form of wind. So in that case, totally makes sense. But then you look at Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania went from, has a total emissions reduction of 390 million metric tons, 324 million tons were attributable directly to natural gas and the move off coal. You look at Alabama, so 100, or sorry, 344 million metric tons, 267 of them attributable to the switch to natural gas. So again, moving away from coal, um, and if you look at what's happened to the price of natural gas, this also makes sense. Certainly there were climate policies that drove the industry in this direction from a generation perspective, but the price of natural gas has come down tremendously um, due to the abundance of resource and its availability through fracking. So one item that I did want to highlight on this map, for those of you who are paying close attention, um, you'll notice we'll take Florida as an example. So total emissions reduction in Florida, 372 million metric tons. If you go to the map on the right, which is attributable to carbon switch and to switching to natural gas, you have 378 million metric tons. Okay, so what happened? Why is the, the number um, from natural gas switching higher than the total? So in cases like that, and there are a number on this map, um, we ended up with a challenge with the baseline. So many of you will be familiar with um, the Crystal River nuclear station in Florida. So Crystal River was online in 2005. That's a huge non-carbon emitting resource in the mix, in the baseline. That nuclear plant subsequently came offline. So the, the baseline actually went up. So you end up with this interesting dynamic of more reduced than the total. And we do see that in a few other places. If you look at the number for California, for instance, um, California num California's numbers, total emissions reductions, 56 million metric tons, which is surprising given the policy there, numbers even higher for switching to natural gas. And the reason is because in the baseline year, there was a tremendous amount of hydro available on the system. And that's not an occurrence that happens every year. So again, if, if you're interested in further analysis um, and further understanding of this, I'll, I'll put my information in the chat box. But, but the takeaway from this slide for the people on the phone is first, 5,500 million metric tons of CO2 emissions have been reduced since 2005. 61% of that is attributable to switching to natural gas. So the next slide I wanna spend some time with you all on, um, and, and depending upon where you spend your time in the industry, the, this may or may not be familiar to you. So what we've seen in the last one to two years from the big electric primarily electric utilities in the country, is a series of commitments to various levels of clean energy. So Excel Energy was actually the first to make a commitment like this. And they said, um, we're going to clean energy by 2050, 100% um, clean energy by 2050. 
and a number of other very large utilities in the U.S. have followed suit on um, Arizona Public Service, Duke Energy, um, Entergy, Ameren um, are a number of the big ones. And they have made clean energy commitments, but these commitments are not all the same. So they really come in three flavors. The first is total renewables. We're going to go to entirely, entire, entirely renewable portfolio mix which means that all of the generation on the system comes from wind, solar, hydro, and maybe energy storage. And Hawaii has actually been one of the states that, that agreed to do that. Um, the next kind of commitment is we're gonna go to completely car non-carbon emitting generation. And the, the big difference there is that in non-carbon or, or carbon-free commitments, the utilities maintain their nuclear assets which as I mentioned with Crystal River in Florida, that can be upwards of 2000 megawatts per unit or two units. So huge chunks of generation are carbon free, but they're also what we've seen in the baseline for many years. Um, and lastly, and least stringent of the three are net zero commitments. And the net zero commitments um, that have emerged, really they say, okay, we're gonna have renewables, we're going to have nuclear, hydro, all in the mix. And to the extent that we use carbon emitting resources, we're either going to sequester, for instance, carbon capture utilization and storage, or we're going to offset in some way, but they don't commit to eliminating all fossil fuels from the portfolio. So as we take those three levels of commitments that we're seeing, if you look at on the left-hand side, roughly 40% of the load for electric retail customers is now under some sort of clean energy commitment due by 2050. So 40% of 2018 retail sales to retail, retail end use customers is now under clean energy commitments by 2050. So they, what that means is that in one or more, uh, in, in these areas, the, the customers are going to move to some flavor of non-emitting or net zero carbon emitting resources. So 40% is, is a good benchmark. I would suggest it's probably higher than that, mainly because this does not include the big corporate commitments we've seen for renewables. Um, you know, you hear the Googles and the Apples of the world who are saying, um, we're going to go to entirely non-emitting resources to support our data centers, and those big customer um, commitments have not been included here. If you look on the right of the slide, this gives you a sense of the states that have made those commitments. So the states appear in blue, and they're actually a fairly predictable set of players. Um, East and West Coast, Arizona, a little bit of a difference, but they have a huge solar resource. Um, the utilities that have made these commitments are really an interesting mix because many of them have been heavily dependent upon coal or other um, fossil fuels, but they've all said either we're going to all clean energy or they're in one of those three tranches that I mentioned before. So we thought it would be worthwhile as these commitments are becoming so important in the industry to talk a little bit about how these organizations are articulating how they will get to these um, levels of clean energy in the next 15 years. So for those of you who aren't familiar, um, when utilities that are integrated, which means they own generation, transmission, and distribution, typically their utility commissions in the states in which they operate will require an integrated resource plan, which basically articulates how they're going to acquire or build the resources they need to meet the customer commitments that they have in terms of providing clean or reliable service. So with some of the companies that I mentioned earlier, um, we took a look at the integrated resource plans that they have put forward to their regulators. Um, and what the, when they file one of these resource plans, what they do is provide a whole series of scenarios and the cost that they anticipate being associated with them. So what I'm providing to you all here is the results from the least cost decarbonization scenario. So the, the study period is roughly from 2020 to 2034 or 35, so about a 15 year horizon. 
and I would say this is the closest we have to a crystal ball for understanding what these companies are planning to do to meet the commitments they've made. And again, the commitments are all the way out to 2050. So that still leaves them another 20 years to get there. So for Northern States Power, which is Excel Energy's um, Northern Service Territory, they're primarily in Minnesota, um, they agreed to carbon-free electricity by 2050, which means they're gonna maintain their nuclear fleet. They're planning to add 4,000 megawatts of utility scale solar, 1,400 megawatts of wind, they want 1,700 megawatts of firm dispatchable load dis supporting resources. So that could be demand response, that could be energy efficiency. Importantly, they're going to acquire a 760 megawatt plant at Mankato, which they currently have a PPA with, so that's not an incremental build. And they're planning to build an additional 800 megawatts of gas capacity in the mid-2020s. In terms of cost, they're looking about at about a 1% per year um, increase to their customers. So again, I think this brings up an important point that as companies are looking at these decarbonization scenarios, first, gas matters, and it matters a lot in terms of ensuring reliability in the face of intermittent resources like wind and solar. And second, it's one of the vehicles that these companies have for achieving a manageable customer bill increase through the course of the IRP. So moving on to Arizona Public Service. So their time frame is about the same, 15 years. They're 100% carbon free. They also have uh, nuclear units on their system. They're looking at both wind and solar resources along with energy storage. Um, they've articulated that clearly and they actually have a fair bit of energy storage on their system already. They're looking to add almost 1,900 megawatts of either merchant PPA natural gas or hydrogen ready natural gas. And again, we'll talk about hydrogen when we get into some of the conversation that, that um, Walter and I are gonna talk about at the end. Um, they're looking at about a 1.3% 1 1 increase to customer bills through this scenario. Duke Energy. So Duke Energy's commitment is somewhat different. Duke Energy falls into the net zero by 2050 which means that they have not committed to taking all fossil resources off their system, even at that late date. They're talking about the integration of utility scale solar, onshore wind, energy storage, and 7,300 megawatts of incremental natural gas in this 15 year time frame. Residential bill increases of about 1.5% 1, 1 per year. And last but not least, um, Virginia Electric Power, this is the um, Dominion's um, regulated utility in Virginia, same time frame, they've committed to net zero in, by 2050. They're looking at 16,000 megawatts of renewables, various types, big play for energy storage, and adding 970 megawatts of gas-fired combustion turbines. They're looking at a higher residential bill increase potential um, but the, the point here is that um, all of these scenarios rely on natural gas additions over the 15 year period, in spite of those longer term goals of committing to either carbon free or net zero emissions. So in my mind, this, this speaks to two things. First, there's a, a general understanding in the industry today that natural gas is gonna remain critical to ensure the reliability of um, the electric system for the foreseeable future because it's needed to balance out the increasing intermittency at the wholesale level. And second, as long as cost continues to matter and natural gas remains a low cost provider resource, I think they're gonna continue to show up in these IRPs as a resource um, that helps keep them manageable. You know, you, we're gonna have states that say, no, there, we don't want any carbon emitting resources on the system. And they're going to struggle with how they have customers willing to pay for those kinds of changes on the, on the grid. Um, so anyway, that, that's what we see as coming. Um, and I know that, I know, Walter, I know you had some, some questions for me, so perhaps we can go to those. The, the last slide just gives you a brief rundown of the areas within which we work in the energy sector, both electric and gas. Um, if you're interested in this analysis, you can go to our website as it's, um, the link is there for you. 
and you can subscribe to the energy industry update that'll be published in a couple of weeks. Right, thanks, Tristan. That is a great example of something we've been saying all year is that uh, natural gas is going to have to be a partner um, of renewables going forward. So, you know, appreciate those examples. I, I think I'd be interested to see, you know, what other trends you see in the electric sector going forward. Sure. Um, so one of the big things that we're hearing a lot about, um, for, for those of you who aren't familiar with my background, I spent a lot of time on the transmission and distribution side of the electric side of the, the industry. And one of the big things that everyone's talking about is electrification. And this is electrification of everything. This is electrification of heating, of um, electric vehicles. Um, and we're seeing a lot of people project that electric loads could increase substantially. I, I looked up the number earlier today, and in the same time frame that we just talked about where these companies are making these commitments to go to some flavor of clean energy, EPRI has project, projected with electrification, we could see electric loads grow by anywhere from 24 to 52% over what they are today. And that immediately brings, brings to mind the question of if, if we're looking at significant gas needed to meet the 15 year time frame and then we're going to increase the amount of load on the system that is currently being fed by natural gas resources is it realistic to think that we may move beyond natural gas when the loads have increased so much so i i think the industry has not yet figured that out and i think it's one of the places where we're going to um, see further analysis to try to figure out will with the electrification moves in many states will we be able to meet the same clean energy targets thanks yeah it does seem like if you're going to dramatically increase the load over that initial baseline plan that we looked at you know you would have a definitely more of a need for lower cost resources so um i think you know one of the other things we hear a lot about is potential competition from hydrogen uh, going forward, right? do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, how do we, how should we look at that? You mentioned it a minute ago as well. So, you know, hydrogen is an interesting story right now. It's getting a tremendous amount of play, and the U.S. DOE has focused on this. I actually just downloaded a ha handbook about hydrogen and and where the industry is headed across um, the world, actually. And I think it, one view of the world is that hydrogen has the opportunity to supplant natural gas as a resource and my personal view is that that is very optimistic on the part of hydrogen advocates and the reason i say that is that um our we don't have the infrastructure today to transport and utilize hydrogen the way we do natural gas um as as an aside i happen to be married to a scientist who studies combustion so this has been a, a dinner table conversation for us recently. And one of the things we've talked about is the fact that, you know, you can't just switch out hydrogen for methane and expect everything to work. In fact, your better bet could be to start to add hydrogen to the natural gas stream, particularly in cases of end use customers. And there's actually a pilot that's being done in Canada right now where they're integrating 2% hydrogen to, into an LDC system, I believe it's in Calgary, um, to test out how it behaves in end use appliances. There's also an opportunity for hydrogen to be added to the, the fuel mix in um, natural gas generation sites. So rather than a competitor, I think there's actually an opportunity for hydrogen, hydrogen to be a complementary resource to natural gas um, using the same infrastructure to the degree that's possible with that mix of fuels. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, the fact that we already have the infrastructure in place to move a, a gas and just increasing the volume by adding hydrogen. Um, yeah, I like that. So, uh, I mean, what, what opportunities and challenges do you see for the natural gas sector in the next you know, 10 to 15 years? So, I, my view is that we, we're living in a world of extremes, and I, you know, that's kind of the understatement of the day, given everything that's happening in, in today's society. And I think natural gas has the potential to be a victim of that, frankly. 
we're seeing certain states and cities be be very targeted in their readiness to introduce gas moratoria or ga bans on gas in certain jurisdictions. So you have one end of the spectrum that says no gas anywhere, anytime, and gas is the bridge to nowhere. You know, we've, we've heard, heard about gas as a bridge fuel and they're saying that's not going to work, it's all stranded assets. And then we have the other side of the equation that says go with the cheapest fuel every time, and that means we're going to be using gas for 100 years. What I would suggest is that there is a middle ground um, and the risk that we see, and as I mentioned before, hydrogen and, and natural gas have the potential to be very complementary resources. But if we go into a mode where utilities are forced by regulators or state legislation to actually shut down their gas system, we use that, at, we lose that as an option. So at this stage of the game, my fear is that we lose optionality because of the, the extremes in the debate. And, and my true hope is that we can start to find some of this middle way that enables us to both meet carbon goals, which natural gas has enabled us to do in the last 15 years, and perhaps further um, a more integrated solution. All right, we have a, just a few more minutes. Um, I guess the, the last thing, I think we'd all be interested to know if you see any major competitors to gas over the next, over that time horizon. I mean, I, I guess there's things like energy efficiency and um, you know renewables that we talked about, but it, it sounds like, I don't know, what, maybe a middle path or something like that. And what's, your, what's your thought on those things? Yeah, well, again, I think it depends on where you sit, whether you see um, these other resources as competitors to natural gas or as potentially complementary. You know, in, in my mind, as we continue to integrate renewables on the system, we could put together a plan that has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of megawatts of renewable resources and hundreds of megawatts of battery storage um, that eliminates the need for gas. In that case, none of us will be able to afford to put the lights on. So is that true competition to gas when cost matters? I don't think so. You know, and in the same way that hydrogen, you know, could theoretically be a true competitor to natural gas, but its attributes are so different that perhaps finding a way for them to work together makes the most sense for both the industry and for the end use customer. Great. Well, I, I think, you know, we're, again, we're trying to keep this short. Uh, if you have questions, follow-up questions, you know, feel free to uh, follow up with Kristen. Uh, and I think her uh, contact information should be in the chat box. Or if, if you aren't able to use that, then you can find her at that website below. So, uh, you know, do subscribe and hopefully you've got a few uh, pointers or points to use in your conversations as you're uh, taking action for natural gas. So thank you all for participating in this program. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you, SGA. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. Thank we you. Appreciate it. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Kristen and Walter. And, and Kristen, I don't know that your email address has shown up yet in the chat box. So if you would go ahead and put it in there and make sure you hit that send option just so the audience can grab it. Also wanted to let you know in the chat box is the link to the next webinar in the series on October 12th. So you have an opportunity really quickly to click on that. Um, we did have a couple of people ask if this session is being recorded. It is, and a link will be sent out to everybody with the recording, as well as a certificate for any professional development hour time. So Kristen, thank you so much for the thought provoking conversation and Walter for the questions you asked. Thank you to our audience for attending and once again, participating in our Natural Gas Take Action Month. And with that, we will go ahead and conclude today's webinar and wish everybody a wonderful and safe rest of your week. Thanks, everyone.